All right. Today, I am speaking with Dr. Rick Boshart again, and I'm so glad to have a chance to have part two of the conversation we had recently. It was a really enlightening conversation. I, I got a lot out of it, and it was viewed quite a bit on this channel. So a lot of people were really listening to the message. You were talking about how DEI is impacting the quality of surgical care and the training of young surgeons. And I think it's a really alarming it, it's really alarming for lots of reasons. And, you know, I've, there are some trends in medicine that have been concerning to me over the past, well, over my lifetime, really, but that I'm seeing a lot right now. And there are many things I'm, I, I, and I, I feel like I could kind of go lots of directions in asking you questions, but one of the primary ones that's coming up uh, very acutely recently is this trend in surgical gender surgeries, gender care. Um, and this seems to be coming out of nowhere. Like there's, what are the ethical boundaries of doing these kinds of operations, especially on young people that permanently change someone's life and body and render them sterile and have long-term consequences and adverse events. And I just, I, I, I know as a plastic surgeon that you might have some opinions about this or some knowledge about it. I don't know how much you're involved in that kind of work or or anything, but I thought I'd open it up and see if you had any thoughts that you might be willing to share on that topic. Well, I do have some thoughts. I always have thoughts. I always have opinions. So <laughs> yes, and, and people tell me I, I'm not really too hesitant to to voice my opinions. Um, I guess to start with, I would say that it, it's kind of remarkable that we have to have this discussion today. Uh, you would have thought some of these things would be settled by now, but they, they clearly are not. Um, and uh, just to give you some personal background, um, I was first exposed to, and only very, very uh, superficially, to uh, gender, uh, to transsexual surgery, what they call transsexual surgery back in the day, um, when I was a medical student. Uh, and this is at University of Miami, which is a, a major medical center uh, down in South Florida, of course. Uh, and there was one general surgeon, it wasn't even a plastic surgeon, um, that was uh, doing uh, gender affirming, what we call gender affirming surgeries today. Uh, and he was considered by everybody an outlier. Uh, and he wasn't doing a lot of it, but he was the only one in the medical center among the many surgeons there that was willing to do this. Well, a couple of things. First off, everyone he did was an adult. He was not doing children at all. Mm -hmm. um, and these were almost exclusively male to female, um, you know, transitions. Uh, and I have no clue what the preliminaries were, or how much, you know, psychiatric or psychological counseling and preparation and hormone and all that went through. But, you know, obviously this was, my gosh, uh, I graduated in 1978. So we're talking over 45 years ago. So things obviously have changed quite a bit. But what's interesting is that that what used to be very, very, you know, kind of quiet in the background, it was being done in various places. It wasn't spoken about much. Uh, it was certainly not spoken about in public uh, and the media. Um, you had the few very rare um, uh, outliers in the day. Um, uh, who was the famous tennis player that uh, uh, transitioned uh, um, I can't remember, but anyway, there was a very famous uh, professional tennis player that transitioned to female, mm. uh, and uh, apparently successfully so. Um, okay, so then you move, you know, you move forward into today, and all of a sudden, I mean, you can't get away from the topic. I mean, everywhere mm. you turn, um, in the news and the media, uh, in my own profession, in, in plastic surgery, uh, we have gone to where now, you know, they have courses that are being provided to plastic surgeons. Uh, to learn how to do some of these operations. And I'll, I'll mention a little bit of the, the technical aspects of that shortly. Uh, but, you know, everyone is basically involved. And, and it comes down to a couple of really, really, uh, I feel, basic questions. Um, uh, one of them is, is simply biology. And, you know, it used to be uh, what I would call settled science. I'm not sure I like that term because science is really subtle, but it used to be pretty settled science that there were two biological sexes, male and female, and you can define them in any way you would like. Uh, I listened to a recent um, uh, podcast by Colin Wright, uh, who writes a lot on this, this topic, and he gave a very simple definition that I thought was a great definition. 
um, you know, there's he was talking about the importance of the binary sex. And one is that, you know, males, basically you define a male as someone who produces uh, male gametes or sperm mm -hmm. uh, and females are, are you know, uh, the ones that produce ova or eggs. Uh, you don't see females producing sperm. You don't see males mm -hmm. producing eggs. And that's about as basic as it gets. Mm -hmm. um, one of the problems with a lot of the things that we talk about these days is the importance of understanding the language that we're using and making sure that we're, we're have our definitions in line. And so you have this issue of sex and you have the issue of gender. And uh, they're sometimes used interchangeably. I, I don't believe they are after doing a lot of reading on this. I think sex is just what I said. Sex is biological sex. Um, there's never been a third sex. I mean, no one's ever proposed a third sex that is not male or female. There may be variations between male and female, but it's always between the binary. It's never between one, two, and, and a third. Uh, and then you have gender. And I just looked up today out of curiosity where we stand. We're presently at 72 plus genders, okay? And uh, uh, I'm not going, because I, I consider this to be a family-friendly podcast, I hope. Uh, I was looking up a few. And what's interesting is that there are some genders that are completely impossible to define. I don't even know how the people that claim the genders can define them. A gender, what, is, what does it mean to be a gender, no gender? Okay. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be non-binary? If you're not binary, then where, where are you? You're, you're, you know, again, there's no third sexual, you know, uh, uh, state condition. Um, there, there was one, I can't say it, but there, there's gender, and then the F word, that's a, that's a, that's a category of, of wow. gender wow. In, this, in this long list of 72 genders. And then you have the really interesting ones like two spirit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I, forgive me, but I can't even begin to give you a clue what the heck that means. Mm -hmm. So these are basically gender is something which seems to be related to relatively speaking, how masculine or feminine something is. And again, everything has to be, has to be, uh, the terms are used in relationship to a binary gender because otherwise they don't have any coherent meaning. Um, they involve belief. They involve, you know, a person's opinion. Uh, oh, the other thing, and, and they evolve a degree of, of fluidity where none of these things are fixed. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're, if you're born male, you will always be male. There's, there's nothing you can do that will make you non-male. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing with female. Uh, but the the gender people seem to feel like you can shift from one day to the next, from one moment to the next. It's, it's whatever you feel at that moment. And, and everyone is expected to accept that, to accept that and to deal with you in that manner. No matter how undefinable your gender is, we're expected to change, you know, eons, generations, millennia of, of scientific knowledge to accommodate the beliefs and opinions of individuals that um, have decided that they're going to walk a different path. Mm -hmm. um, what was the other thing? I looked up delusion because because one of the first things that I thought when I heard about this whole gender dysphoria thing is that, you know, this sounds like delusional thinking. And if you'll permit me, I'm going to read a definition that I got off of uh, uh, Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Uh, delusion is a false belief or judgment about external reality held despite incontrovertible evidence to the contrary, occurring especially in mental conditions. So if you have a fixed belief that is not in agreement with, with the reality around you, that is considered to be delusional thinking. And as plastic surgeons, we do deal with that. You know, we have people that come in that have an opinion or a belief about themselves that is clearly not right. In fact, there's a condition called body dysmorphic syndrome where people come in and, and um, they tell you about themselves and they'll describe some feature that is severely deformed uh, and you just don't see it. It's just mm -hmm. not there. I, I recall one patient came to see me that came in because she had this huge bump on her forehead mm -hmm. that was, she wouldn't go out in public. I mean, she, it was, it mm -hmm. was a stretch for her to come for her appointment to see me. And she wanted me to remove this bump. There was no bump. I mean, there was no visible bump. There was oh, no wow. nothing I could feel. And what can I say to her? I, you know, I can say, I, I don't see anything. There's nothing here that leads me to believe you have a bump that I can do anything about. 
And I know she left very, very unhappy with me because mm. I would take her bump off and mm. probably went back to her house and back into isolation again. Um, so, you know, my job is not to affirm somebody's delusion. Uh, it's, it's simply to to help them to see reality. And there are people that, you know, they have this fixed delusion that um, they need to have, this is really extreme, but have to have a, a, a part of their body cut off. Mm -hmm. It could be anything from a finger to an entire leg or an arm. And they have this fixed belief that they're not complete until this particular thing is done. Um, so, you know, the, the whole idea that, that we're here to affirm the, the belief of someone that doesn't correspond to, to reality of the world around us, that's a problem from the get-go. Um, one thing, too, that I've seen, and, and this is something that's been documented uh, uh, very clearly, is that there has been a very significant uh, change in the, the demographics of people that are claiming to have uh, gender dysphoria that feel that they're in the wrong body. Uh, as I mentioned, when I was a medical student, these people were predominantly male adults. They were people that some of them may have had uh, a belief that they were in the wrong body going back even into childhood. But, you know, these things were being done. Uh, these were adults making adult decisions uh, and moving forward. Now, the the issue and the, and the real controversy is regarding children and adolescents and even uh, young adults. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what was it? Uh, the, the clinic Tavistock Clinic in England, the single largest clinic doing gender affirmation care, um, over the course of several years, they reported literally a 4,000% increase. I mean, that's un unbelievable mm -hmm. in going from primarily adult males to predominantly teenage females. Mm -hmm. This is where the, the term rapid onset gender dysphoria came into, into being and where the term social contagion, where they were, they were saying, you know, that there was definitely uh, a contagious aspect to young girls identifying as trans because their friends did that and they were picking these things up out of out of social media and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, throughout throughout history, you know, trans identified people have been in a fraction of one percent of the population, a fraction. And yet there are schools in the USA where they report that, you know, 20 and 30 percent of the girls are trans or they are identifying as trans. So there's obviously a problem here. And I think that any discussion of this whole issue needs to very clearly distinguish between, you know, young adults, youth and children and, you know, adults, mature adults that are making decisions that are that are, you know, you have to give them their due that they have agency mm -hmm. to make decisions for themselves. And doesn't mean you have to do what they ask you to do, but at least um, you're not the one that is um, forcing the issue in some manner. Um, a couple of other things that I wanted to mention. This was interesting because this was new to me. Um, again, I'm I'm learning as I go. I have, you know, I I understand basic biology, the things I just said about gender and sex are, are pretty much to me clear and 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 not uh, subject to a whole lot of argument or discussion. But uh, you've probably heard the term autogynephilia. Have you mm -hmm. heard that term? Yes. Uh, and I was in, you know, at the physician. You think I would have known that, but I had to look it up. Um, which is interesting, and this is males who basically obtain um, sexual arousal uh, from seeing themselves as a, as a woman or female. And this is one explanation for men who seem to be so insistent on getting access to to women's restrooms and to women's locker rooms and to you know identifying with women. It's not that they believe they're women. It's just that they get off on the idea of being a woman, which... Mm -hmm not being a psychiatrist or psychologist, I would think, you know, you, you better be darn sure that you're not dealing with something like this as opposed to a true situation of, of gender dysphoria. Um, now, you're, you're asking about plastic surgery, uh, which is my area. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can speak to this a little bit. When I came into my practice 35 years ago, uh, I made a decision uh, right off the bat not to do these operations. Um, and that it was... You know, I, I, it wasn't like a conscious decision, like I had the stream of patients coming in for consultations for, for sex change. But uh, having been exposed to it earlier, it just wasn't something that appealed to me. Well, um, I had one experience with a uh, individual that had gone through the whole, this is an adult, not a child, an adult that had gone through the whole uh, 
uh, crossed sex hormones and lived as a female for uh, a long time. And uh, it happened to be the son of one of the nurses in her hospital. Mm -hmm. And she asked me if I would be willing to do a breast augmentation on this individual who was a male and was, you know, living as a female and transitioning as a female. And I said, well, I thought about it. I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll give it, you know, I'll, I'll willing to, to do that. So I, I did the consultation and I did the surgery and everything turned out fine. The individual's quite happy. <clears throat> I was very disturbed. I, I was un very uncomfortable. There was a lot going on in this person's life. I mean, this mm -hmm. individual is living what I would call, uh, you know, um, kindly an alternative lifestyle of, of a significant degree. Um, and I just did not feel comfortable being a part of that mm. and supporting that, reforming that. And so based on that one experience, even though it was technically successful, I decided I'm not doing this again. Mm. And I will tell you, my partner, uh, who is younger than I am, uh, was a bit more open to this than I was. And I think he did one or two similar cases. And he came to me later and said, you know what, after those, I'm not doing this again. This is just not something I'm comfortable doing. Um, so, you know, plastic surgery plays a significant role, uh, not so much in the early part of the process, but at the terminal end of the process where people are actually going through a physical transformation, not just a physiological one or a sociological one. Uh, you know, they're, they're, you're trying to build, you know, organs out of, mm. out of something that doesn't really exist at, at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, what I've read is that if an individual, if, if, for example, adolescents uh, go through the puberty blocking hormones and they continue on those. And apparently there's a significant percentage that do not, but those that do invariably go to the cross sex hormones where they're, you know, for example, the females put on testosterone. Um, and in those cases, they have a very large percentage that go on to gender affirming surgery, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, obviously goes into uh, creating uh, uh, male organs uh, or female organs where they don't already exist. And there are some very ingenious operations that have been devised to do these. I mean, if you look at just the technical surgery, um, you know, on, a, on an objective uh, level, it's, it's kind of fascinating what we can do. Um, when I was in training, microsurgery was still in its infancy. Um, and it was very much more advanced in, in China, for example, than it was in the USA. Um, and they were doing some amazing things. Uh, the The program that I was in uh, was headed by uh, an iconic plastic surgeon, and he had a tremendous amount of experience using techniques that would be considered today uh, outdated uh, for reconstruction. And some of those techniques involved the creation of, of tubes mm -hmm. of flesh and, and uh, fat and so forth uh, for reconstruction. And that includes even making a tube to create a penis. Mm. And I was involved in one of those cases uh, for a patient who had uh, their penis removed for cancer. Mm. We we're trying to build a penis. And this was a multi-stage operation to accomplish this. Uh, in China, uh, they would do this in a essentially uh, a single or a two-stage operation using mm. microsurgery. And they would take uh, skin and fat and, and bone and, and so forth from a person's arm and transfer it to the pubic area. Uh, it would leave a, a pretty horrendous defect on the arm, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And they would build something which would, you know, look a, a little bit like the real deal, but it really was not. Um, the other side of the coin is to is to create uh, female genitalia, a vagina, uh, out of a male. And they have all sorts of ways to to use the skin and, and the glands and so forth to do this. Mm -hmm. But one of the problems is this: these are these are technically really, really difficult operations to do. The idea that a, any plastic surgeon—I don't care how qualified they are—can go in and take a weekend course or even a week-long course, and then start doing these operations on people, to me, is is uh, a level of, of arrogance or cluelessness that, to me, is scary. Mm -hmm. um, I think it takes a long time to perfect these. I think that. If you're going to really be doing this in a practice, uh, if you're committed to the surgery, uh, you have to go through a fellowship. You have to be under the tutelage of experts and have a significant number of cases under your belt before you go out and you start practicing on the public. And many people are not doing that. They're, that's just not the way it's, it's being done. 
Um, and that's that's a little bit scary to me. Um, the other thing is that all these operations carry significant risks. Um, I recently was uh, uh, one of the people that testified at a meeting of um, the uh, Texas, um, oh, it's, it's, it's a commission, uh, part of the uh, Health and the Human Services Department of the state of Texas. Uh, they are involved in all sorts of aspects of, of medical care. And one of the things they do is they established uh, inform, they established informed consent so that if a person is having an operation for something in Texas, there will be a standardized informed consent that is used by, by surgeons um, so that it, it stipulates that all these uh, different things have to be covered with a patient. You know, the risks, the alternatives for the, the procedure, um, the expected outcome and things like that. And so I was one of the plastic surgeons that testified there. And to do that, uh, I did some research. And what I found was really scary because some of these operations carry major complication rates, not just a little, you know, stitch abscess or a little wound infection, uh, but major complications in, in 30% or more of the surgeries. And I'm not aware of any operation that has a 30% complication rate of, of serious complications. For example, uh, a total breakdown of your suture line. If you if you connect um, the urethra to the bladder and that thing uh, comes apart, uh, you're going to be having urine spewing out of a wound and, and doing things that it obviously shouldn't do. Uh, and then you have things like strictures. Strictures are where you have a, a passageway that becomes significantly blocked by the tightening of the scar tissue. And there's only two ways to deal with strictures. One is to reoperate, and the other is to, to try to stretch the stricture. And as often as not, that becomes an ongoing process that never ends. You have to be continually stretching that to prevent that from reoccurring. And this happens, for example, in, in uh, vaginal reconstruction. It's very common, very common for you know trans women, men who have become women, to have to perpetually... Uh, stretch the vagina because if they don't do that, it it begins to tighten down to where it, it's not functional anymore. Mm -hmm. So you know, plastic surgery um, uh, is not a uh, panacea for this, and plastic surgeons of all specialists should be the ones that are most humble mm -hmm. in assessing what we're capable of and what we're not capable of. And again, it goes back to it, it, this is something which. You know, when done in adults, you can say, okay, well, the adult knows what they're doing. They've been properly informed. When you're talking about a child who, by all other measures, is not considered to be uh, mature enough to make decisions for themselves. I mean, you have children going through transition that, you know, they can't buy cigarettes. They can't vote. They can't, you know, they can't get a driver's license. Um, and yet we're allowing them to, to make decisions based on their own perceptions which we are, as health professionals, obligated to affirm. That's what affirming care is. You don't question. Uh, if someone comes to you and they say, I'm trans, you accept that at face value, and, and you move forward with whatever it is that will that will affirm that particular thing. So uh, I don't know if I've, I've gone on too long or, or said anything, but uh, if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. Uh, I don't know if I have any. I had a, a little bit of, of uh, stuff that I picked up on queer theory, which is really interesting, but uh, I'm going to stop for a moment so I, I don't get too tedious and boring and, and see if you have anything you want to weigh in on or questions that you want to ask. Well, I don't think it's boring at all. I think it's really fascinating. And I think you've touched on a lot of angles. One of the things that I've been wondering or that I'm excited to speak with you about is this idea of elective consumer surgery. Like when you mentioned the woman who comes in and she thinks she has a bump on her head, there's there's your own, as the doctor, there's your clinical assessment of what's going on with this woman. Are, are you seeing a bump? Is it is it just that it's not that bad to you? I mean, there's got to be some sort of subjectivity there where you, you, you sort of see what the patient is talking about, but or maybe you don't see it at all. At what point does the consumer just get to say, I want to remake myself? And, and it, where does your ethical training and your responsibility as a, as a surgeon come in? I mean, I can imagine like breast augmentation, does the woman need, like at what point is it a need? Is it a thing that you, you ethically feel good about doing? Maybe she wants 
uh, ridiculously outsized breasts and you determine, no, I don't think that that's healthy. I, I don't feel good about being a part of that surgery, but maybe she wants very modest size. So, I mean, I imagine that I, I don't really know if how surgeons think about this. So I'm clumsily trying to talk about a framework that I don't really understand very well, but I imagine there's some assessment that goes on when you're deciding what's appropriate to do for a client or a patient who wants to surgically alter themselves. Well, you, you've actually asked uh, one of the questions that is uh, a constant in the specialty is what's reasonable to do. Mm -hmm. um, I went into plastic surgery with a bias against cosmetic surgery. Mm -hmm. um, I trained, uh, not everyone does, but I trained uh, for a full residency as a general surgeon. And I uh, uh, practiced for three years in the Navy doing that, which means Everything from trauma to, you know, to breast cancer uh, treatment to colon cancer to you name it, uh, whatever a general surgeon does, I was doing. Uh, and when I started to find myself attracted to plastic surgery, one of my concerns was uh, that it was somewhat trivial and frivolous to be taking all that, that you know, that intensive training that I'd had and all of a sudden start doing nips and tucks on people that just wanted to look nicer. Mm -hmm. And so there, you have to find some way to reconcile that. And, you know, hopefully you do it in a way that's not going to be hypocritical um, and, and be able to do this in, in a manner that uh, makes some sort of sense. So initially what I said to myself was, well, I don't have to do cosmetic surgery. I can just focus my practice on reconstruction and that's all I'm going to do. And that way I can feel good about myself and I'm not, I'm not out there as, a, as one of these Hollywood nip and tuck people. Um, it's kind of funny that when I left uh, Okinawa, where I, I finished my Navy career and, and my peers knew that I was going in, into plastic surgery, um, they gifted me all these, these crazy things. One gave me these Hollywood glasses that would glitter, you know, and stars and whatnot, because they figured I was going to go off and be a Beverly Hills plastic surgeon. So when I got into my training, um, I didn't I didn't know this ahead of time, but my uh, my training director, Dr. Millard, um, had one of the biggest, busiest cosmetic practices of any surgeon because of his reputation. Um, not many surgeons have a two to three waiting list. People are mm -hmm. going to wait two to three years to have him do their cosmetic surgery. Uh, even today, that's almost unheard of. I'm happy to have my schedule filled two or three months in advance. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he did a tremendous amount of reconstruction and, and it was, was primarily known for that. So I, I asked him, I said, Dr. Millar, uh, how do you justify doing cosmetic surgery? Uh, and his answer was always interesting. I've never forgotten it. He said, Rick, if you can't take something normal and make it better, uh, you will never be able to take something abnormal and make it normal. Hmm. So you have to be technically as good as you can be and you have to know what you're shooting for. And one of the principles that he uh, espoused in our program, he was very big on principles, was to know the ideal, beautiful, normal. Mm -hmm. So we were trained, if we were doing, for example, a, a nose or ear reconstruction, we were trained not to just put a blob of tissue on someone's nose or, or missing ear, but to try to produce a nose or ear that was as beautiful as possible, that looked as much like it naturally should. And that would carry over into the cosmetic work. Um, another justification for cosmetic surgery actually came out of a movie. Do you remember Doc Hollywood? I didn't see that. No, I haven't oh seen that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, who was the star of that? The, the, uh, the guy that was in black of the future. What was his name? Um, oh, oh gosh. Uh, Michael J. Fox. Michael W. Fox. Yeah. It's, oh, okay. really, it's horrible because when I want to pull up a name up and I want it, I can't get it. <laughs> anyway. So Michael W. Fox was justifying going into cosmetic surgery because he says that the the money that you make in cosmetic surgery allows you to be free to perform uh, surgery on needy patients without having to charge them. In mm -hmm. other words, you can do it altruistically. Mm -hmm. Well, I will tell you that most plastic surgeons don't operate that way. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of plastic surgeons, they're just out there to to do cosmetic work and, and increase their financial portfolio. Mm -hmm. Dr. Millard used to go regularly to Jamaica to do reconstructive surgery and, and actually received uh, an order of merit from the Jamaican government because mm -hmm. of his many years of doing work down there. So he really, truly uh, worked in, in a manner like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
But there is that aspect that reconstruction truthfully pays very poorly. I mean, it's, mm. it's my practice. Uh, I could not sustain my practice the way it is without the cosmetic income that I make. Mm. Uh, and I can take patients that, you know, I don't worry about whether a patient can pay or not. Uh, my biggest concern is usually whether they can take care of the hospital costs for me to be able to work on them. So there's that aspect of it. And then there's the other thing, and that is that, you know, when you start talking about people being vain, um, uh, you know, you ask yourself, well, you know, think of what you do, what anybody does when they get up before they go out uh, into the world. You know, they comb their hair, they brush their teeth, they put on some makeup, they they take some time to select the clothing they're going to wear. You know, we, we don't just walk out of the door in our birthday suit. Uh, and all these things have an element of vanity. I mean, people naturally want to to look their best when they're out in, in, in public. Uh, among their fellow human beings, and that's a natural a natural thing to do. Um, there are tribes that, uh, you know, to identify with the tribe, you go through various and sundry uh, things. One particular uh, 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 practice is to scar your body. Mm -hmm. uh, they will create little cuts and scratches throughout their body in various patterns and they will rub ash or sometimes animal dunk. I mean, it's crazy what they do. Mm -hmm. They don't die, but they don't. Uh, and these things cause an inflammatory reaction, and they get these keloid scars, and they make these beautiful patterns of scars over their faces and bodies. And that's their idea of beauty and identification with their tribe. So mm -hmm. uh, plastic surgery is the extension of all of that. Mm -hmm. um, as a plastic surgeon, I one of the things that I feel very responsible for doing is to look at each patient coming in and assess not just what they're asking me to do, but trying to get a handle on their motivation behind doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I always ask patients, uh, the, the, the example you gave of someone who wants to have a breast augmentation. Um, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, women want breast augmentations because men like big boobs. That's absolutely not true. Um, in my experience, uh, women, uh, the majority, at least, you know, the population that I see, um, they either want to restore something that they used to have and that they've lost. And, you know, they've got one or more pregnancies. They, the breasts have deflated. They're now sagging. Um, and they want to get back to what they originally were because that's the way they see themselves. They don't like what they see with these changes. Uh, and the other are the women that just really, truly, you look at them. Uh, I happened to have seen a consultation yesterday for a young woman. And she literally had no breast. I mean, she had no more breasts than a woman has who's had a mastectomy. Mm -hmm. She had a flat chest with nipples, and that was the extent of it. And in my opinion, that's not a vain cosmetic procedure, mm -hmm. even though insurance will not cover that. Um, that is is really a reconstructive procedure. So in addition to looking at what the patient's asking me to do, I try to get to the motivation behind it. Mm -hmm. And if, for example, I always ask, do you have a significant other? Do you have, are you married? Um, and in that sense, I asked them, well, who are you doing this for? I mean, mm -hmm. are, is, is your is your significant other or your you know, your partner or your husband, are they supportive? Which to me, even though it's a decision for the patient to make, if you're in a, a close relationship, a long-term one, I would think you would take into consideration the opinion of your partner. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also ask, is this for you or for them? And um I don't remember the last time someone came back and said, well, I'm doing it for him. Mm -hmm. Someone may say I'm doing it for both of us, which is perfectly okay, but I, I want to make sure that this is being done for them and not just for the other individual. I have had patients come back to me that have regretted doing surgeries because they did it for somebody else, and now that mm -hmm. person is not in their life. Mm -hmm. and They find themselves regretting having done that, and, and to the extent that they can, they want to undo that. So... Um, you know, cosmetic surgery is, is unique. It's the only the only place where you're doing a surgical procedure on somebody that's not medically necessary simply because they want you to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't I don't hold myself up as a pure technician that's here to to offer my skills to do whatever patient asks me to do. Um, I find that uh, the further along I've gone in my career, um, the more willing I am to tell somebody no. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's the bad idea. Uh, I do see people there, you know, you're, you're, uh, I think alluded a little bit to people that go through one operation after another. And there are definitely people 
that are plastic surgery addicts, Mm -hmm. once they get started on that road, uh, they don't seem to know when to quit. Mm -hmm. And I've had a number of occasions when I've had to actually tell someone, no, this is enough. You've done enough. Uh, I've seen some people come in that looked absolutely bizarre. I mean, Mm -hmm. they're they're pulled so tight and they they look so strange that, uh, you know, you wonder, how do you how do you see yourself when you look in the mirror? Do you think this looks good? Because Mm -hmm. in my mind, this looks terrible. Mm-hmm. And so I have to tell them, you know, what I typically do is say, I don't think you need anything. I think mm-hmm. you're fine the way you are. Mm-hmm. I think maybe once or twice I've said uh, you've had enough, but uh, mm-hmm. I try to let them down as, as gently as I can. At the same time, I'm not going to just simply do an operation because they want me to. So I don't know if I've covered that sufficiently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds like you you do take into account the person's con the context of their life, their, their motivation for wanting the surgery. And when it comes to these, these gender affirming surgeries, one of the things that uh, it seems like fertility and a person's capacity for procreation is just not even a consideration. It seemed, and that's so strange to me. I remember when I was younger, when I, uh, my daughters were really young. I had a neighbor who was a couple years older than me and had one child and she wanted to have her tubes tied because she wanted to be permanently sterilized, knew she didn't want any more children. And she couldn't get a doctor to do this because she was a woman who was still in her twenties. She was in her twenties and she was deemed too young. And it was the response she was getting. And I remember she was complaining about that. She was upset about it. She couldn't, she'd done a couple of consultations and she was hearing these people uh, basically telling her that she might change her mind and they didn't want to be responsible for doing that. So there was a, it was a no-go. We're not doing a permanent sterilization on a woman in her twenties, but, but for this woman at this point in time, and this would have been like 20 years ago or more, um, she was, this was her primary objective was about the sterility. She wanted to, to not be reproductively capable anymore. And she was being told no. And now fertility is being treated as a, as just a side thing. It's not even the primary, it's not even a consideration. We'll go ahead and do these operations on very young people that render them permanently sterile. And the, it, it seems like there's this letter writing process. And I've talked with a couple of detransitioners and, and I, I know there are these letter writing projects where therapists will give a green light just it's like a paper play and it, or, or even free, they'll donate their time to talk with prospective clients or with clients who are, uh, who self-identify as gender dysphoric and they will just give them a green light. They have letters already ready to go that, that they just fill in the, the form with this patient's information. And it says, I've assessed this person and they're mentally fit for gender affirming surgery. And then the surgeon, I, I presume takes the letter and then gives it's the green light. So that, that is performing that psychosocial assessment piece for you. It's already done for you. So it seems like both sides are kind of expecting the other side to be doing this. And, you know, I, there's a presumption on the part of the, the therapist, I suppose that the surgeon wouldn't do this if it wasn't appropriate. And then there's a presumption on the part of the surgeon that if they've got a letter of recommendation from the therapist, then the psychosocial evaluation has already been done. Anyway, it seems like it's a really strange, like there are exceptions being carved out for this particular kind of care that aren't present for other things, other sorts of elective surgeries. Yeah, that's, that's terrifying when you think about it. And and mm-hmm. you have, obviously, you've got a, a educational background in, in therapy, and, and uh, that's kind of been your your focus, I think, uh, in, in much of your life. And the idea that a therapist would um, kind of uh, uh, escape or avoid their responsibilities for a proper assessment in order to rubber stamp someone's own idea about what they're they're doing and send them on and say, okay, uh, I've done that and I can wash my hands of it and it's not up to me anymore. And for a surgeon to accept something like that um, is also pretty scary. Um, uh, it, that's, that's a complete, oh, what's the word I would like to use, bastardization of the system. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's completely counter to, uh, to good evidence-based medicine. 
mm-hmm. uh, where you treat people as individuals. These these they're coming in, and what they're being seen as is oh, this is another adolescent trans kid. Mm-hmm. You need to pass this on to to get them into the system and get going here. Mm-hmm. Right? Instead of asking the hard questions, okay, what's your what's your family life like? What other issues have you had in your you know in your life? Mm-hmm. Uh, how long have you? Uh, the other thing too is is uh, you know there's been a, a very very flippant attitude with respect to uh, the issue of uh, puberty blockers. And um, mm-hmm. and I won't even go on the cross-sex hormone, but to to think that we have such an understanding of all that goes on in the transformation from a child to an adult going through puberty, to me, is, is the ultimate of arrogance in medicine. And one thing, medicine should never be as arrogant. I mean, we mm-hmm. have to be humble that there is so much we don't know. And what, what's interesting is that the more we learn, the the more things we realize that we don't understand yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, we don't have a, a, a decent understanding of the immune system. We really don't mm-hmm. um, and how it works. And, and that goes into so many uh, areas of, of of medicine and so many illnesses that, you know, there's hardly anything that does not relate to a person's immune system, yet it's a complete mystery. of The, the clotting system, how, how do we, you know, what is it that, that why don't we all bleed to death when we cut ourselves? How does how does the 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 process of clotting know when a a blood clot needs to stop and we don't turn into one big clot every time we get a scratch? Um, There's a lot of things about this that, you know, that I think we have to be very, very humble about. And it's not just, you know, the idea that, oh, yeah, this is reversible. We can just put them on a puberty blocker for a year or two. My understanding is that even the people that are doing these things don't like to keep. children on puberty blockers for more than a couple of years uh, because of the many side effects, uh, which they seem to kind of just gloss over. And, you know, it's, it's not just the, the loss of fertility. I mean, that's that's a, a big deal. I mean, because to expect a 15 or a 16 or 17 year old to know that they're not going to want children, even when they're in their 20s and 30s, I think is asking more than any human being should be expected to be able to, to state with certainty. Uh, but the things that I've read as well from a, a plastic surgery standpoint is when you, and then this, there's a couple of very, very uh, prominent examples of this, where if you take a person and you put them through puberty blockers, they don't develop. Okay. Yeah. The, 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 the secondary, uh, or the, I guess the primary sex organs, the, the vagina, the penis don't develop to the same degree. And so when you go to do surgery on them, uh, it becomes a way more difficult, uh, process, um, that is fraught with complications. And sometimes uh, the surgeon is struggling to recruit enough skin and fat and, and, and tissue mm-hmm. to produce something remotely resembling a, um, a normal you know, male or female organ. Um, uh, yeah. Who are the Jazz Jenkins? I am Jazz. She was one yeah. of the, the, the textbook uh, uh, boys that became a girl. And mm-hmm. oh my gosh, if you read her story, and the comp, you know, the complications that she has experienced with her, uh, her surgeries. It's you think oh, you know, you've turned a, a normal child that may have had some, you know, some psychological dysfunction that probably ninety percent of the time would have resolved itself if they did nothing. Yeah. And you take them and turn them into this this gender affirming cripple that's going to be yeah. on medications and undergoing surgery for the rest of their lives, and with with no studies showing that the long-term outcome in terms of resolving this dysphoria is is worth it. Um, it, it makes me ashamed. It really does. I, I look at what's happened to medicine in so many areas, and this is only one of several. Uh, it makes me really ashamed that, that medicine has taken this turn to what I call a, a very, very dystopic uh, type of a situation. I'm reminded, I, I, for some reason, I pull up a lot of things out of movies that I've seen. And uh, I remember this the scene from uh, Saving Private Ryan where the uh, Tom Hanks tells the sergeant, he says, you know, the world has taken a turn for the surreal. Hmm. I look around and I see this in so many areas where I'm thinking this, this you know, you'd have to write this into some kind of a crazy movie to hmm. to make some sense out of it. But to have, to have this happen in real life uh, is absolutely beyond uh, anything explicable. Yeah, the the argument for the puberty blockers seems to be that if you can halt the 
puberty, you are preventing a person from starting to present more like the natal sex that they are so that it's easier to help them cultivate the look of the other sex so that they stay more gender neutral looking as a child that hasn't developed those secondary sex characteristics. And, and yet there's what you're so pointing out, bone, yeah, there are so density. many bone yeah. density and there's a, I watched a presentation recently by a researcher named Sally Baxendale, who points out that there's a real dearth of research on what this is actually doing in human subjects. We haven't studied it well enough. And what they have studied with animals shows that there are actual uh, developmental stages that you don't, if you, if you block the hormonal channels during these times, you, the, the person does not catch up and the animal in animal models, they don't catch up. They don't go back and complete that development. And that has cognitive uh, res uh, consequences down the line and other kinds of consequences for the, the development of that individual as an adult. So you actually don't pause puberty and then restart it later. The person misses developing in, in important ways. It, according to the very little research we have, we don't have any research that shows that they're safe, certainly. But, well, you're but taking even just, off, oh, I'm sorry, don't no, worry. no. Yeah. It's just even, and, and that's one side of it, but the other side, like you're saying is even if you just want to think about cosmetic results, which seem to be the, uh, the logic behind doing this in the first place is that the person who is gender dysphoric, if they truly are quote unquote, true trans, then they will have a better chance of presenting and passing as an adult. So that's the whole logic behind this puberty blocking thing is to give the, the individual a chance to determine if this is truly their path. And then if it is to give them a better cosmetic result so that they can pass as an adult. But what you're saying is that it actually not nece that's not necessarily true. They might actually get a less desirable result or a, a higher likelihood of, uh, of adverse events from surgery if yes. they don't have the material well, to work with. Well, uh, I think it's fairly accepted even among the people that, that, you know, promote these things, uh, this gender affirming stuff. I think that most people understand that a lot of the, the youthful gender dysphoria will resolve itself that, you know, and, and the numbers I hear are anywhere from, from 70 to 80 to even 90%. Mm -hmm. Of youth who profess to be, you know, claim they're in the wrong body that if you don't do anything if you simply raise them you know obviously uh you have to to deal with this in some manner but not by by hormonal manipulation um that the vast majority of these children will resolve their dysphoria and settle into their their what they call you know your sex assigned at birth mm -hmm. and be very very uh content to move on with life in that manner and that uh, uh of those uh, that don't seem to do that, a significant number turn out to be not trans, but gay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, nowadays, you know, it seems like trans is so popular that some people would rather come out as trans than come out as gay because it, there, it mm -hmm. seems to have less of a stigma in, in the minds of some people. Mm -hmm. um, it's really in kind of insane. It's, you're taking a process that is so, it, it's so time dependent for one thing. I mean, puberty occurs once in your life and it occurs over a certain window uh, that's very, very specific for each individual um, and incredibly complex with you, you're not going to go through anything in your life. Uh, maybe the closest thing would be pregnancy in a woman, but you're not going to go through any other period of life where so much change is going to occur everywhere from your physical development to your mental development as during puberty. And to think that you can shut that off and shut it back on like you flip a switch to me, it is so ridiculously simplistic that it, it blows my mind that an educated medical professional would ever think that. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, what is behind the mindset of someone that believes that you should take the, the word of a 7 or a 12 or a 17-year-old at face value that they know better than anybody else uh, who they are and what they are, and on mm -hmm. that basis, you're going to determine a course of treatment that's mm -hmm. going to have lifelong consequences. We haven't even touched on, you know, we touched on the fertility and, and this may seem frivolous. I don't think it's frivolous, but when you think of the importance of sexuality 
to to people you know how many people's lives are enriched by their their sexual relationship with you know a spouse um and uh you know it's known that a lot of these treatments can completely eliminate the capacity for a male or female to ever experience a sexual satisfactory relationship with orgasm and so mm -hmm. forth and i'm thinking okay well you know maybe that's not a big deal for some i would think that for some people it'd be a very big deal mm -hmm. and that that should be in your study a lot of the stuff is being done in a manner that suggests that this is settled and that's one of the the worst parts of it um i could it'd be hard to see, but I could better see if this was being done in a totally experimental manner with a clear understanding that this is not settled science mm -hmm. and being done very cautiously. The problem is there, there are certain things that we do in medicine where the ability to get informed consent is really next to impossible because how do you get informed consent from a child to do things to them that are irrevocable? Um, so you're doing things, uh, and the only way you're going to find out is to do these things and then to go back and see if they were good or bad. Well, of course, the die is cast for those individuals. Yeah. And one of the problems that I see is that you don't see good long-term results. The, and people seem to ignore the ones, the few that are out there. There are studies from Sweden where you know trans-identified people are not ostracized. They're very accepted. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very nurturing environment, if you will. Um, and they have done long-term studies of, of people that have tran fully transitioned. Uh, and 20 years down the road, uh, they have suicide rates that are multiples of the rest of the population. So there's obviously a, a problem that's not being solved by going through these transitions. And yet we seem to act in the U.S. as though those studies don't exist. Um, most of Europe has backed off. They've mm -hmm. hugely backpedaled. I mean, they mm -hmm. closed the major clinic in England uh, based on what they thought was was uh, substandard care. Um, other countries, Germany and, and, and Sweden and other countries have followed suit um, in backing off of, of primarily, again, uh, you know, children, adolescents, young, young adults. Uh, and yet in the USA, we just have pedal to the metal and moving forward, and these people are defending this. Um, uh, I honestly, I don't understand it. I, I think that there is there's an underlying agenda, underlying ideology mm -hmm. that basically um, just transcends all considerations of of standard of care and you know evidence based science and and good medical care. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're seeing that in other areas as well. I mean, ideology has become something that has kind of taken over the country. Um, I don't know if, if other people have, have thought about it this way, but what I read and I really believe to be an accurate uh, description is that um, this whole issue of ideology stands on three legs. Hmm. You know, the term woke is, is used to the point where maybe it's being overused and some people really don't seem to understand it. But this whole idea of, of woke, wokeism and woke, um, progressivism, some people call it, uh, left uh, is also another term, but it stands on three legs. Uh, one leg is one that I have been involved with that we discussed in our previous podcast, which is the idea of, of systemic racism uh, mm -hmm. and power struggles in the world. The second is this issue of gender dysphoria and queer theory, which is an extension of, of, of um, the critical theory that uh, uh, also gave birth to, to systemic racism. And the third, ironically, is climate change. Mm. Uh, you know, if you don't believe in climate change and as being an ex as existential uh, risk to mankind, then you are clearly, you know, out of the loop. You're an evil person. You don't care about the human race. Um, and uh, you have to buy in to the idea that we have to completely upend society and change everything we do in order to achieve this uh, utopian uh, goal of, of zero carbon. Mm -hmm. So you have three legs. Each one of those is, is supporting an ideology um, that I think is over everything. And I think it, it completely ignores humanity. It completely ignores the individual. 
Uh, everybody is, is you're part of a category. You know, you're mm-hmm. a trans kid. You're not mm-hmm. some troubled child that has this, this, that, and the other, and has a a belief in 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 some issue with your sexuality. But you're a trans kid. You're part of that population of kids mm-hmm. that we have to be affirming. Um, I think I think medicine is, is lost, uh, Leslie. I really do. I hate to say that because mm-hmm. I've devoted my life to it. Uh, to end a career, it's like ending a career. And finding out that everything you did was for naught, that it, it doesn't have any lasting value, that all the things you believed in basically have been refuted or, you know, it's maybe you know, like if you were a flat earther and your whole life was was based on uh, uh, the premise that the earth is flat. And one day on your death, deathbed, someone comes to you and shows you proof that the earth is not flat. And you realize, oh, my gosh, what did I spend my life doing? I, I have a little bit of that sense where, that to me, it gives me a, 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 a little bit of a, a sense of urgency or responsibility to do the things that I'm doing today. Having a conversation with you as a part of that is 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 my uh, opportunity, which I'm very grateful for, to put out some some opinions and some ideas that I think are worth discussing and debating and should not be shut down because they don't fit somebody's consensus or or narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, why should I be silenced? Because I disagree with gender affirming care. Nowadays, there are there are there are journals that won't publish you mm-hmm. if you're not going to, you know, accept this as the standard of care. That mm-hmm. you, you can try to get published, you won't. Um, we're in a degree of censorship that is just uh, unbelievable today in, in our in our science and, and, and medical journals, uh, uh, going back to even before before COVID. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's uh, we're in a crazy time. Uh, one of the curses, uh, I can't recall which uh, who came up with this. I think it may have been the Chinese. Uh, uh, the curse was may you live in interesting times, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I think we're absolutely positively <laughs> living an interesting time. One thing I have not been for as long as I can recall now is I have not been bored. Um, <laughs> I remember moments in my life and I said, oh, gee, I wish something would happen because, you know, there's not much going on. Gosh, darn it. There's every time I turn around, there's something going on somewhere that calls my attention or I'm I'm aghast. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. just beyond able to understand where someone is coming from thinking what they do. So yeah, we're we're living in an interesting day. Well, it's profoundly difficult to face the kind of disillusionment that you're talking about at, as you approach the end of a career that has meant a lot to you and that you've dedicated your life to, and to see the field, the way that you the way that you describe it now as lost. And I think that a lot of people, I think that that's a big part of why a lot of people have trouble turning and facing that because it's so difficult to do so. It's so sad. And it's so sad to make those, to admit to yourself that you have the concerns that you have. And what uh, I think that it's, I'm, I'm really grateful to you for sharing your time this way and for talking about this. I'm sure that it, there's pressure on you to conform, as you say, that your field is kind of circling the wagons right now around some of these ideologies like like you say not allowing you to publish in journals only supporting one kind of thinking publicly anyway and so it must be really hard for you to do this and i'm i'm really grateful that you take the time to have these public conversations well this is this is why something like what you're doing is so critical i mean because if if there aren't people like you uh, and others doing these sorts of things um the word is not going to get out and people that think as as I do or as you do, oftentimes feel like they're alone, that they, you know, that they're they're lost in this this mass of humanity that mm-hmm. believes in a way that they simply can't accept. And I think when people see videos like this and they read articles, uh, I, I just got an article published yesterday in City Journal, which I'm very pleased about, um, about the uh the degradation of, of surgical education, which I I attribute to several things, but one of the things that I think is going to make it worse is the devotion to DEI and the American College of Surgeons. Um, but, you know, it, the ability of, of, of people to get the word out is is critical, and we have to find um, unique and imaginative ways to do that, because you're not going to necessarily be able to do that 
always on something like YouTube or Facebook or, or Instagram or whatever. And you're sure not going to get it in the mainstream media because most of them are going to shut you down if you say something that counters the the opinions of the 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 people that run those those institutions. Um I had something about that that I wanted to say. Um give me a second here. Um I'll, it'll come to me. Sometimes I'll get a thought while I'm speaking and then I try to grab it and it's just not there anymore. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is super important to have something like this because, oh, I know what it was. I know what it was. Yeah, it, it does come back to me. My my brain is gone, but not totally gone. It's, just, <laughs> it's going. I should say it's going. Uh, I've always had a bad memory for certain things, but gosh, when you get to my age, every time you forget something, you think, oh, is this it? Is this the beginning of my, oh, my depression? Gosh. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is a scary thought. Uh, yeah, I I know so many people. Uh, specifically, I know a lot of surgeons who are so disenchanted and discouraged by what's happening in our profession that they've disengaged. Okay, they're not willing to the on to be truthful. I know a couple who engaged earlier in their lives. Uh, there's uh, uh, there are surgeons that were very active uh, politically. Uh, they were pushing for for reforms in medicine. And they did what they could for years, and they finally left. Many of them left disillusioned when they when they learned um, how how Washington works, for example, mm. um, how hard it is to get something done, and how all the work you do or attempt to do can be totally destroyed by someone very very quickly who decides to to pick something apart or just simply refuses to to push whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, and it's sad. Because I, I think that if, if people would engage, I think there would be a groundswell of opinion that w- would shock people. I think that that we are in the majority. We are not in the minority. I think that um, someone someone just published today something about the, the 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 world will be saved or some such thing by the normies. Uh, mm-hmm. I love that. It's not going to be saved by the extremists. It's not going to be the extreme right or the extreme left. It's going to be the people that are reasonable, the people that live a, a day-to-day life where they they uphold certain values that have always been, you know, valued uh, in society, you know, traditional marriage, uh, uh, you know, faith, um, hard work, uh, advancing based on merit, uh, judging people uh, by their character, not by their appearance, all these sorts of things. We're not the minority. We're the majority. Uh, and I think we've been been made to believe that we are not, that if we hold these conservative, okay, uh, I've always disliked labels, but a conservative is someone that is seeking to conserve. What are we trying to conserve? We're trying to conserve things that have stood the test of time, you know, our constitution, our judicial system, and, and all these sorts of things have, have withstood uh, all sorts of assaults over the years. Um, and we're trying to conserve some sort of a uh, uh, democratic republic that that holds up certain things, you know, the equal uh, law under the under the justice system. And, you know, if you work hard, you will advance and everybody has the the equal opportunity to make the most of themselves and responsibility. People are responsible for their their actions, their words and, and so forth. Um, so I think that we need to get this word out that that persons with these more centrist views are not the minority. We are the majority, and we have to make that known. I'm trying to, to as much as I can, get some of my fellow surgeons on board. It's difficult. It really is, because some of them are tired. Uh, they fought the battle, and they've they've left uh, the the playing field they're up in the stands just watching now Uh, others are just so disgusted with what's happened they they can't even imagine themselves re-engaging because they just don't believe that that the things have gone to a point where they can be retrieved or recovered i don't know if they can i don't know if we can get back to to devotion to excellence and surgery above everything else i don't know if we can do that but uh, i'm willing to give it a shot um the thing that gives me some hope, in addition to meeting people like yourself and a lot of other wonderful people that I've, I've encountered, uh, is that there are young people out there. My own my own children uh, give me hope because I have three grown children that are hardworking, 
adults, you know, married, have kids, have careers, uh, and are trying to live their best life uh, according to the principle that that have been around forever and have really stood the test of time. Um, my uh, daughter and son-in-law were both physicians. I feel a strong responsibility for doing what I can to leave them with a profession that at least to some degree has maintained its integrity. And I think that in a lot of ways it has not. I don't want to become some old man in a nursing home looking back and saying, gee, don't I wish I'd spoken up at this time or, or done this. And so I may be, you know, a Don Quixote tilting at, at windmills and having nothing to show for it someday. But at least if I can look back and say, okay, I try within my limited capabilities, my limited intellect, my limited time, I did the best I could. Then at least I can I can go off into my whatever my next reward is going to be, uh, feeling some sense uh, of of contentment, I guess. Well, I think that integrity is really admirable, and I I think that that's one of the pieces of feedback that I've gotten a lot since I started making these videos. Is people <clears throat> people find this one of the things that I've heard a lot is you're so brave. You know, I saw that a lot in the beginning when I was posting these people would say that. And I thought, well, I don't really feel brave. I just feel like I'm compelled to speak up and this feels very wrong. But the fact that so many people said that illustrated for me how, how valuable and a characteristic that is to people and how much people admire that ability to speak with integrity and I think that there's, my hope is, and my thought is that there's something contagious about that as well. And that the more that we promote this kind of, it, it, you're speaking truthfully, but with humility and from a place of internal consistency. And I think that there's something really beautiful about that. And I think that it it is contagious. I think people will see that and will value that. And hopefully it'll have a ripple effect, not only people taking seriously the content of what you're saying, but also watching you, uh, watching you display these important personal characteristics. I think that this is very valuable and I have a lot of respect for what you're doing. And thank you so much for your generosity with your time and for taking the time to share your thoughts and your educated opinion. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. As you said, it's really a weird situation when someone tells you you're courageous or brave, <laughs> maybe because you're stating something which is obvious or truthful. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the fact that it takes courage to do that, I, I think it, it indicates to some degree where we are today. Um, yeah. I don't consider myself brave because, honestly, I don't have that much to lose anymore. Uh, I wish I'd been braver when I was younger, when I had more to lose and spoke up. Um but, you know, as the saying goes, better late than never. So maybe it will encourage others to, to speak up that are, you know, a little bit hesitant, uh, maybe have more to lose uh, and think that they're they're alone when they really are not. Oh, I hope so. I think so. And thank you again so much, Dr. Bosart. I appreciate it, Leslie. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, what's the saying? We have to stop meeting like this? I hope not. I hope there'll be another <laughs> opportunity at some point. Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe I have to bounce back to your husband first before we yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would love to meet with you again. Thank you. Very good. Have a wonderful afternoon. You too.